Greetings, X-Plane fanatics of the world! Captain K-Man here with another cold and dark tutorial. Today, as promised, we'll be looking at the Jar Design A320 Airbus and how to get this lovely bird from cold and dark to hot and ready to fly. We'll be running through initial safety checks, power-up procedures, cockpit preparation procedures, MCDU programming, and the taxi out and takeoff part of the flight. We'll be using Drew Desky's KDCA Ronald Reagan International Payware for today's tutorial, and we'll be flying for Frontier Airlines aboard their gorgeous Griswold the Bear livery you can see rotating here. Uh, I had actually uh, posted this tutorial yesterday, but after watching it myself, I realized I missed several things, and overall it just didn't go as smoothly as I wanted. Uh, you all deserve the very best tutorials that I can possibly make. And uh, the one I posted yesterday was not it. So uh, here we are with version 2.0. Hopefully this goes smoother. So uh, let's hit up the flight deck and we'll start getting things ready. So first, I'm going to do a little pan and scan here. Make sure my frame rates are okie do And they look pretty darn good. All right. So, uh, well, first up, uh, a little known fact, uh, unless you've followed me on AvSim all these years. Um, I hate the Airbus in real life. <laughs> I hate it. I hate it. I hate it as a passenger. Uh, I hate being a passenger on this aircraft. Uh, I have yet to have a smooth flight experience. Uh, whether I fly with American or Delta, just, ugh. It doesn't, it, it doesn't help that I'm a well-known uh, Boeing fanboy. You know, if it ain't Boeing, we ain't going and all that flag-waving stuff. But um, the reason why I don't like the Airbus in real life is because, to me, it shakes and rattles and rolls and jostles around way too much uh, in flight. Uh, it's very wobbly and even the lightest of turbulence, uh, at least to me, my senses. And, uh, whoa, man, those CFM engines. Holy crap. I don't know whose idea it was to strap two 5,000-pound babies under the wings and then smack them on their ass and uh, let them howl for 10 minutes nonstop during takeoff without putting in proper insulation, uh, but you should be fired, all right? I'm sorry, you should be fired. All right, so anyway, enough Airbus hating, right? Well, Captain K-Man, if you hate the Airbus so much, why do you have it in your simulation hangar? And why are you going to buy the Flight Factor A320 when it comes out? The answer, my sim friends, is this. I may hate it as a passenger, but as a simulation pilot, Oh, it is so much fun to fly. This is a very, very fun aircraft to fly. I also uh, wanted some variety, so I don't always have to fly a 737 on my virtual flights with worldwide virtual. The 737 and the A320 are two of the most widely used airplanes in the world, so I decided I needed them both in my hangar. Okay, well, anyway, enough of that trivia. Let's do some tutorialing. Is that even a word? I scrub and challenge myself, and I have lost once again. I always lose to myself all the time. It happens so often. <laughs> so here we are. We're on the flight deck, right? You just bought this beast, and you're looking at all the buttons, switches, and knobs, and you're drooling all over yourself like an idiot. Never fear. Captain K-Man is here. Now, regardless of which payware company you choose to simulate your A320 experience, whether that's the jar design here, or Flight Factor uh, on X-Plane when it comes out, or if you're on uh, E3D or FSX, I believe uh, Aerosoft and Flight Sim Labs give you your best simulations possible over there. Uh, but regardless, this tutorial is kind of universal, um, at least parts of it. I'm going to uh, try to do everything how it is done in the Airbus Operations Manual, so you can take this lesson to any platform. Um, you may need to tweak uh, a little bit uh, for whatever aircraft you are using, but for the most part, if your plane is programmed right and has all the simulated features, uh, it should work. Now, inside this aircraft, for anything that's not simulated, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway, just in case one day we actually push uh, we actually get to push the buttons and flip those switches that are not simulated right now. So, uh, first thing is first, we need to do the safety checks, the initial, uh, flight deck safety checks here. So, ooh, itchy, itchy, scratchy, uh, 
So when we first get into the flight deck here, uh, we're going to check that the thrust levers are in the idle position. And what I'll typically do here is actually jostle them with my joystick just to make sure it's operational. And then I'll pull it back until I hear it click. The engine uh, start switches should be in the off position. The engine mode selector should be in normal. Parking brake should be set. The gear selector here should be in the down position. And in the overhead, our windshield wipers should both be in the off position. And they are. And that concludes the initial flight deck safety check. Now we can move right on into the power-up procedure. So here's how that works. First, we need to look up at our overhead panel and go right here to the center point where the electric panel is. And then on this aircraft, uh, it's very simple, especially when compared to the Boeing 737. Uh, we just need to turn on batteries one and two to start with. So click, click. I want to listen, make sure all the cooling equipment is turning on with the batteries. And there it is. All right, so next up, we're going to look up the center panel here to the APU fire test system. We're going to push the test button and ensure that we have red lights on the fire warning and that the squib discharge lights are illuminated. They are, so we release the button. Now, at this phase in the power-up procedure, if we had an external ground power unit, um, we'd actually have the exterior power available to us and we could just push that button and boom, everything would fire up. But since this aircraft has flown quite extensively over in Europe, and as far as I know, Europe doesn't use ground power units that often. They rely more on the APU. They just fire it up right at the beginning. We're going to do that procedure today. So the reason why we just did the APU fire test is because we want to make sure that that works just in case the APU explodes or catches fire while we're starting it up. So to start up the APU, we look down here at the bottom center panel and we turn on the master switch and then we push the start button. It's that easy. You can hear the APU starting to spool up in the background. And now we just have to play the waiting game here while the APU uh, does its self checks and spins up to the speed we need it to be so we can switch over to APU power. Doesn't take very long. We'll get a little chime here and this will uh, turn green. Boom. There we go. All right, so now we have power available to the aircraft. Now our next step here is we need to set up the cockpit lighting as required. This includes the floodlights, integrity lighting, overhead integrity lighting, overhead dome light if needed, and the PFD displays. So we do that by turning this knob here to the right. That gets us our overhead lights. And then we're gonna come down here. We're gonna turn on the left side flood and the integrity lighting. Come over here to the right side flood, turn that on. And then we'll look up here to the left to brighten up our PFD to maximum brightness. Now in the jar design A320, anything that you do on the pilot side of the aircraft is going to be mimicked on the first officer. They didn't split the uh, aircraft's uh, switches and knobs apart, which is kind of disappointing. Um, these systems should be separate from each other. I know they did it for ease of use because most of us aren't going to have a first officer sitting in the aircraft with us. But uh, just keep that in mind. All right, so that's actually the end of the power on procedure. Pretty simple, right? Especially compared to the Boeing 737. So next up, we're going to go back to our overhead panel above, and we're going to start the overhead scans. Now, this is different than the Boeing flow. In the Airbus, the uh, safety scans are done from the bottom up instead of the top down. So we're going to go bottom up on the left, bottom up on the center, and then bottom up on the right side here. All right. So what does an overhead safety scan entail? Well, we need to make sure all of our systems are working properly here. So first things first, make sure the wiper is in the off position, uh, just in case we accidentally bumped it here. No lights should be here on the calls. Crew supply light check. Make sure it functions. The uh, manual mask system should be in a guarded position. Next up, we're going to test out the flight recorder, our data recorder's uh, 
ability to record. This is not simulated in the jar design system. Hopefully uh, Flight Factor's uh, A320 will simulate this. Uh, and basically all you do is you click this button here and it would set the ground control into the off position. You would then depress the CVR test button. You would then get a series of beep, 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 beeps, and then you release and turn the ground control back into auto mode. As you can see here though, it says in op because they, uh, they don't simulate that here. Ground proximity warning system. I'm gonna go ahead and cycle all of these. They should be de-illuminated when you're done. Next up, emergency electrical power. Both caps should be guarded. No lights on the buttons. Moving up, evac should have no lights. The flight control computers, one, uh, ah, screw myself up here. The flight control computers here should have nothing illuminated. This is not simulated here. You can see the buttons say in op. Next, we come to the eight ear system. This is the equivalent of the IRS alignment system on the Boeing 737. First thing, I'm gonna go ahead and turn system number one on so I can actually get the uh, LED displays going here. I'm gonna go all the way to test to make sure all of the LEDs are functional. And then I'm gonna switch the knob back to status mode and I'm gonna start turning these on in sequence here. We're gonna turn on number one, then number two, then number three. When you turn it on, the align light will come on, on bat will illuminate, and then extinguish. Do the same thing for two, and the same thing for number three. We'll get a message up here, telling us to enter our position. For now, we just press enter, and now we have seven minutes until we are aligned. Moving back down to the center console, it's now time to turn on the seatbelt lights. The no smoking sign, emergency lighting to arm. Turn on the navigation logo light to let them know outside that there is power to the aircraft. This is where your dome light is. If we had required it, we don't because uh, it's early morning here in Washington uh, and we can see perfectly fine right now with all the floodlights going here, so we're good there. Next, we check that the landing elevation knob is in the auto position and that no lights are currently illuminated. Probe heat should be in the auto mode, which means no lights. Anti-icing are not required right now. If it was uh, cold outside, uh, we would turn these on at the appropriate time. But right now, they should, be, uh, they should be unlit. Moving up next, it's time to get the bleeds running in the aircraft from the APU so we can get some air conditioning running. I'll adjust my AC knobs here, make it nice and cool back there because it's summertime, and then we'll turn on the APU. And then I will turn on PAX 1 and PAX 2. You'll hear those kick on here in just a second. Now the next up, I'm gonna do the battery test. To do that, we're gonna require uh, shutting down the batteries here in sequence and monitoring their conditions on the ECAM down here. I'm gonna to switch to the electrics on the ECAM here and I'm gonna turn off battery number one by cycling it. I'm gonna come down here and make sure that the bat registers as being off. We should see a transfer bus here uh, still lit. That means the battery is charging properly and is functioning. We'll do the same with battery number two. And it is in good condition as well. Turn it back on. Next, we move on to the fuel pumps. All of these should be engaged. There shouldn't be any lights on there. The hydraulic system should be completely unlit at this time. And lastly, for the center panel, we're gonna do engine fire test number one and number two by depressing the button. We see that the fire light illuminates and the squid discharge illuminates and engine two. Same, same. Coming back down to the right side panel, we check that the wiper is in the off position. The manual engine starts, should have no lights. Ventilation, no lights. The cargo smoke extinguishing systems should have guarded caps on them. There should be no lights at this time. And if this system was actually simulated, which it is not on the jar design, we would depress the test button 
and we would get all kinds of bell lights and whistles there. Cargo vent should have no lights, and the right side flight control computer should have no lights. Moving on up here, as we turn our head to the left at a weird, awkward angle, we turn on our radio stack, switch to VH1, and then if it was simulated, which it is not, we would adjust our audio sources and the volume levels by selecting them. Certainly we want to have PA turned on and um, ground crew, uh, cabin crew, and of course VH1 would need to be selected as well. We continue going up to the very top panel. We double check to make sure that none of our circuit breakers are popped. None of them are. And our audio switching should be set in the normal position. That concludes the overhead scan, and now we're going to do the center panel scan. We're going to come back down here. We're going to check our standby instruments to make sure that they are fully functional at this time. Um, if this had been all skewed and screwed up, I don't think this is simulated here, uh, we would just grab this knob here and we would pull it out, and that would make the artificial horizon line uh, recenter itself um, and get this uh, system ready to go. Next up, we check that the anti-skid nose wheel steering system is in the on position. Later on, this will be switched off once we begin our pushback. And once pushback is complete, we will turn it back on. But right now, it's where it needs to be. And that's it for the center panel scan. Next, we're going to do the pedestal scan. So coming down here, we check to make sure that both of our MCDUs have power and that they are showing a display. They are. We would uh, come down here, make sure that our radio is turned on here, which it automatically turned on when I flipped the switch overhead because all those switches are connected. All three radios in the jar designs are all linked together, which kind of sucks because that means if I select VH2 over here, it goes to VH2 over here also. So I can't split the uh, microphone source or the audio source out. So, oh well, it is what it is there. I would also set all of my standby nav modes to whatever I need them to be right now. Which right now I don't have any of that information in front of me, so not detrimental to the operation of the aircraft, but uh, not really useful right now either. It's not quite wholly simulated. So we would come down here and we would turn on our PA system, the cabin, the intercom, adjust our volume source levels, all that stuff, same as before. Next up, we come down and ensure that the weather radar is in the off position right now. There shouldn't be any radar running at this time. Next up, we're going to come back up to the center console here, and we're going to check our switchings. All of these should be in the normal position, and they are at this time. There shouldn't be any reason for these to ever be in any other position other than normal when you... Uh, load into the jar design aircraft. Next up, we're going to do do the uh, lower ECAM checks right here on this display. We're going to look at the engine page, make sure that we have good oil quantity in both engines. We do. Next, we check the hydraulic system. We see that the hydraulic system is currently not powered on, which is good. We don't want to kill anybody out on the ground with sudden wheel movements or uh, control surface movements. Uh, and next, we would switch over to the status page, but it is not simulated in this aircraft, which is very, very unfortunate. Because on the status page, all these warnings that you get here, you would get a full listing going down the right side here. Um, and they would be color-coded based on the severity, uh, from cyan to magenta, all the way to red and yellows. So um, they don't simulate that, unfortunately, so we can ignore that for now. Moving down, we make sure that the thrust levers are once again in the idle position, just in case we accidentally bump them. Again, we check the engine start switches are in the off position and that the mode selector switch is normal. Next up, we check that the spoilers are retracted, flaps are in the up position, rudder trim is centered, the parking brake is still set. I'm going to unlock the cabin door so uh, people can actually get in here and talk to us. Next gravity gear extension test. 
This is not simulated in the uh, in the uh, jar design A320, but you would uh, pull the metal bar that's on the front side of this, pull it up, make sure that it uh, comes up, and then we would push it back down and lock it into place until we heard an audible click. That lets us know that our manual gravity gear extension is ready for operation should we have a complete total hydraulic systems failure in flight and we need to get those gear to come down. Moving back up the right side here, we check that the heat cast system is in standby mode. We would set the first officer's radios as required. We would set his audio sources as required. And that is it for the pedestal scan. One final safety check here before we move on to actually programming the MCDU, and that's to test our oxygen. To do that, we need to come over here to the left panel and open it and depress the test. Checks out great. We're good to go. And we'll just close that right back. All right, so up next is the MCDU programming. So uh, let's get in here and uh, get this aircraft orientated, shall we? All right, so this is the MCDU. This is the equivalent of the FMC on the Boeing 737, but uh, that's about where the differences or the, uh, the similarities end. They're both used for programming the aircraft's flight plan route uh, and getting system preferences and all that good stuff set up but uh, that's pretty much where the similarities end on programming these things. So if you're used to programming the 737, this should become very useful to help you get the Airbus program. So the first thing we check here is to make sure that our engines and everything are the appropriate type. We do have a pair of CFM-56s on board. Um, we check that our AIRAC cycle is the current cycle. This one's good until August 16th of this year, so that's good. If you had any secondary backup data loaded, this is where it would show up. I do not. And this is your version number of the aircraft. Now next up, before we do anything else, this is the part where I actually have the fuel truck and the load sheet uh, open up here. So we'll bring those up online here real quick because we need this information set properly before we uh, actually begin programming the aircraft. I'm gonna need my flight plan for this, so I'll pull that up over there on my right side. Fuel truck is connecting outside, and there we go. So looking at my sheet here, uh, I require 12,500 kilos of fuel, so I'm gonna set that right here. 12.5, and have this start refueling the aircraft. Next up, I'm going to look at my payload weight. I should be at 17.2 tons. So that's a pretty full aircraft here. We're going to load it up. We got a full first class on board. So pretty much a full airplane. Uh, we're going to be going out to Denver today for our test flight. Uh, so need to set up some more cargo here to get ourselves aligned some more in the front boom there it is 17.2 tons and we're done refueling the aircraft so now we have our center of gravity that we need and we have the trim wheel settings that we're going to need later when we start programming this all right i'm going to go ahead and just leave this up and running right now so you'll notice when we hooked up the fuel um, and started programming the fuel the mcdu automatically changed to the fuel initialization page all we have to do here is push this button and that loads in our fuel weights. That's all we really need to do on this screen right now. All right? So, we are now ready to actually begin programming the MCDU. So, uh, first, the thing is first, we need to push the initialization button. That's this button here that says init. And that brings us to the init page. Now in the Airbus, anything that is an orange square is data that it is wanting you to input. Most of this data is not optional, or should be considered not optional. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to tell the aircraft where we are in the world. So we tell it we're at Ronald Reagan International, 
and then it wants to know where we're going. We're going to head out to Denver. All right, so KDCA slash KDEN, and we plug that in in the from to right here. Align IRS will then show up. We click this to begin aligning the IRS system. Next up, we are Frontier Flight 719er, I believe. Let me double check. Let me double check. Yes, we are 719er. So we'll plug that in right there. Cost index, I have no idea what Frontier Flight uses for their index, so we'll just put a 10 in there. And our cruise altitude today is 34,000 feet according to our file paperwork. If you have a company route that you generated using your favorite flight plan generating software, this is where you would type in the name, blah, 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 and you would end it there, and it would uh, go ahead and pull in your flight plan. Um, I don't like doing that. I like more hands-on approach. I like typing in everything. It makes it feel more real to me. Um, but if you're short on time and you just want to get up and go, then uh, company route is uh, what you would do. So that's it for the initialization page. Next item up for bid is the actual programming of the route we're going to do today. So to do that, we push the flight plan button right here. And that brings us to the flight plan page. Now I'm going to need my filed paperwork here. And uh, I chose a flight plan that has a little bit of everything today, some SIDS, some STAR, and uh, airway routes. So you'll get an idea of how to program every little piece of information you could possibly need to into your flight plan. So to start with here, looking at our flight paperwork here, given the wind and weather conditions here today, we're expecting runway number one. So I'm gonna click here on KDCA, click on departure, and I'm gonna choose runway number one for today's departure. The SID that we have been filed for is the uh, Wings 3, and our transition is Remay. Now once you've filled out all the available information, you'll notice up here it's been updating as I've been clicking buttons. That is a completed entry, and you'll notice here the flight plan button has appeared and turned yellow. So we're going to click that to pull it into our flight plan, and we'll click over here where it says insert to actually add it. Scroll down until you find the last waypoint that you entered, which was Ramey. That's the end of the uh, SID departure. So from there, I'm going to click on Ramey. And Ramey is going to link up to our first airway, Q72. So you'll notice right here, there are air airways associated with Ramey. That's why you have the airway button uh, appearing here. So I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to put in Q72, and that's our VIA, so we're going to put that over here, VIA, VIA, however you want to pronounce it, and that terminates at the HAX transition, so we're going to type in HAX, and we're going to plug that in right here, you'll notice flight plan here turns yellow, click it to put it in, and insert, scroll down until we find the HAX termination point, and from there we have a bunch of direct routes, so I'm going to start programming in those. To program indirect routes, you click on the last route, and you just start typing them in. So, the, what is this here? We got Mike X-Ray Quebec. Insert. Scroll down until we find that. Click it. Next up is Victor Hotel Papa. Insert. Scroll up again. From there, we're going to head to Indigo, Romeo, Kilo. Insert. Scroll up again. Select that. Next up is Lima, November, Kilo. Insert there. And last, we're going to go to Spawn. Scroll up again, find Spawn, and there's Spawn. 
Now, Spawn is the start of our star arrival. We're doing the Wahoo 2 into uh, Denver today. So I'm going to click on Denver down here. It's going to load all that in real quick. We are expecting the runway 34 left ILS approach today. I'm going to find it in the list. Click here. We are on the Wahoo 2. So I'll scroll until I find a Wahoo 2. There it is. The VIA is the runway approach that you're going to use. For our flight work, our, our paperwork today suggests that we're going to get the BOSS VIA. So I'm going to plug that in. And the transition. Oh, oh, itchy nose, itchy nose. Well, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm screwing myself up here. I actually just overrode something that I needed. Go back to flight plan. Let's do that over again. Go to Kden. In in the reason why I got screwed up there, pilot to ATC is currently reporting that it's going to give me the boss uh, approach, but we don't want to pick that on the via that's going to screw up our actual arrival. Wahoo 2, no via, and our transition point. Actually, <laughs> actually, I think I just double screwed myself over here. We are going to do boss, and we're going to transition to spawn. All right, so forget everything I just said right there. <laughs> I am screwing myself up here. So the VIA, when putting in your star, is the approach vector that we're expecting to get, which is BOSS, and our transition point for the beginning of the star is SPAWN. So all that information is now correct. All right, hopefully I didn't just screw all of you up too bad. All right, so anyway, we click flight plan and we insert that. And that's all of the flight plan. Now, the last thing we need to do is we need to go all the way back up to the top and we're going to scroll down through our flight plan, starting at the top with Washington. And we're going to move on down. And what we're doing is we're looking for flight discontinuities. And I saw a couple when I was in there. So we have a flight plan discontinuity here. This means that once we hit hacks, the aircraft would have no clue of how to get to this waypoint here. So we're going to help it out by pressing the clear button. And we're going to click on the button here on the left on the line where the flight plan discontinuity error is. And then we'll click insert. And that wipes that out. That links these two waypoints together now. We continue scrolling. I see that I have another one here, so we're going to do the same to that. Insert. And continue scrolling down to make sure we don't have any more. And we do not. So our flight plan is concluded. I'm going to scroll all the way back up to the top. And there we go. That's it for the flight plan. But we're not quite done programming the MCDU yet. It needs some more valuable information or else uh, it's going to be a very ugly departure out of here. So next up we need to go to the preference page here. That's this button here that says perf. So we click on that. And now we need to give the aircraft some additional information. The first thing is we need to tell it what kind of flaps takeoff we're going to do today. So we're going to do a flaps 2 slash, that's this right here where it says flaps. All right, see how it says 2 slash here? I'm doing the same thing. I want a flaps 2 departure today. But we need to change this value to the value that's on our load sheet here, which is 0 0.5 down. This is going to make the trim wheel, uh, la, 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 let's try that again in English. This is going to make the trim wheel uh, adjust itself to uh, the number that we plug in here. So that's going to be a down position, DN 0 0.5. You'll notice the wheel starts turning. And it's going to keep turning until it's set into that position. Next up, we need to give the aircraft our flex temperature for the day. The flex temperature is to the Airbus what the D rating is to the Boeing aircraft. We're basically telling the aircraft to not give us 
super duper awesome extreme thrust out of the engines, but to actually derate itself to save on maintenance and wear and tear on the engine so that the engine has a much longer lifespan between maintenance checks. So, this is a very complex formula that I do not know how to calculate, but we're going to just set it there to flex 40. That seems to be the, the go-to temperature if you're unsure, and we're going to plug it in right here. Next, we check that our transition altitude is set correctly for the country that we're in. We are in the United States, and 18,000 feet is the transition point in the U.S. In case of an engine flame out during takeoff, our acceleration altitude is 2,000 feet. So basically the aircraft's going to climb to 2,000 feet on one engine, and then it's going to level off and start accelerating to whatever speed we have uh, set in the autopilot. Lastly, we're going to click on our V speeds here to get our V1, our V rotate, and our V2 speeds. So you can see here today we're going to be hauling some ass down the runway when we take off. And uh, that is all you need to put into the computer to actually get yourself up into the air and get you going towards your destination. I'm now going to put away the load sheet and the fuel truck. They are no longer required. And um, we're going to start playing with the flight control unit here in just a second. We need to call up clearance delivery and all that good stuff, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause the video here and do some magic video editing and get uh, pilot to ATC ready to go for us. So be back in one second. All right, so it's time to program the flight control unit. We've logged in to pilot to ATC and we've tuned into the ATIS. Ronald Reagan, Washington, NAF information, Foxtrot. 1400. This is going to let us set our barometric pressure here. Visibility more than 10. Sky clear. Temperature 20. Two point minus one. So that's a two, two nine or eight eight. eight. Okay. Arriving runway so zero one. right now the zero aircraft four. by default is three set three. to European Departing standards for barometric zero pressure. Zero We're going to click this hot spot three just three. underneath the display window on initial contact, you to have set it Fox into tried. the U.S. mode, and then underneath the pull knob here we have our little hot spot to actually use our mouse wheel, and we're going to adjust the two nine or eight eight. Done. So now we're ready to Ronald call up clearance Washington delivery. Washington I'm going to go ahead and Fox switch Trot. over to clearance delivery. So I don't have to listen to the ATIS. Now the information that we're getting from the clearance delivery guys here at Washington uh, that, we're, that we need for the uh, flight control unit here, the FCU, we need our initial altitude climb, and then for the TCAS uh, squawk box, we need to get our squawk code. All right. So, with that being said, I would make sure I was on VH1 on the radio stack, which I am, and we're going to call it in. So here we go. Frontier Flight 719er, radio check. Frontier Flight 719er, you are loud and clear. Sweet. And now we'll call for clearance delivery. Frontier Flight 719er, ready to copy IFR clearance. Frontier Flight 719er is cleared to Kilo Delta Echo November. Fly the WINGS-3 departure, with the Raymay transition, then as filed. Expect departure runway 01. Maintain 4,000 feet. Expect higher clearances 2 minutes after departure. Departure on 125.65 squawk 5136. 5136. All right, I'll explain what I just did here after I do the readback. Frontier Flight 719er is cleared to Kilo Delta Echo November. Fly the Wings 3 departure with the Ray May transition, then is filed. Maintain 4,000 feet. Expect higher clearances two minutes after departure. Departure on 125.65, squawk 5136. Frontier Flight 719er read back correct. Altimeter 2991er 1 contact ground on 121.7 when ready to taxi. Pressure change. Have a so good we'll morning. Just... Oh, thank you so much. Altimeter 2991er 1 ground on 121.7 Frontier Flight 719er. 
All right, so we got the uh, initial information that we need from clearance delivery, and we got our entire flight plan filed and approved, and we are cleared for our departure today. So what I did here is I clicked this hotspot above the altitude control knob here to set it to thousands of feet. If you click it again, it will switch it back to hundreds of feet. So I switched it over to thousands of feet, set it to 4,000 feet, which is our initial climb out, and then I depressed the button here to lock that into the flight management computer. You see over here, it actually has this little uh, OP climb text on here now. So that lets me know that the 4,000 feet that you can see over here has actually been accepted by the flight control unit. Next up, we went down here and we just plugged in our TCAS squawk identification number for our transponder. Now, uh, we'll do a little bit of house cleaning up here on the FCU. First off, I like to turn constraints on. This gets rid of all the excess information that I don't really need during the departure phase of our flight. Verify barometric pressure is set. Verify that our flight directors one and two are currently illuminated. Set our climb altitude as required. It's done. And we would, of course, check everything else on the right side of the aircraft. get back in the pilot seat here. All right, so at this time, all the passengers would be getting on board. Um, the whole time while you're programming this, everybody's getting on board, everybody's stowing their luggage. And uh, you probably should have about another eight, nine minutes before it's time to actually push back from the gate. At this time, it's when I would turn to my flight officer and we would start the departure briefing and the safety briefing. Uh, I'm not going to run through that today. It's pretty much the same as I use on the Boeing flights that I do. So uh, we're just going to check our SID is correct, that our runway is ex as, as expected, um, our SID transition point, initial altitudes, then we run through the safety checks for failure while well, during, uh, during the takeoff roll, uh, engine fire, and all that other good stuff like that. Now once that's all done, next I would come down here center panel. Actually, let's go down to the center console and look up. Because at this point, I would go into the lower ECAM here and I'm going to check every single one of my pages to make sure all the data looks good. We're going to do engine again. Engine's sweet. We're going to check the bleeds. The bleeds are currently running, no problem. Good pressure from the APU. Cabin pressure is good. Since we're not climbing, there shouldn't be any PSI change right now, and the cabin altitude should register whatever altitude we're at. Electrics, I make sure that both batteries are still functioning and that we are receiving power from the APU generator. We are right now 115 volts at 400 hertz. Transfer bus number one and two are showing 28 volts each. No amps, so we're good to go there. I double check the hydraulic system, make sure it's still not armed for safety reasons. I check fuel, make sure our fuel quantities match what we put into the aircraft, minus the burn, of course. We put in 12,500 kilograms. We've burned off some of that for, uh, with the APU back there. Check outside temperatures are good. Next, I checked that the APU is currently operating normally. It is, no problems there. Air conditioning, good, no problems detected. Door status, I noticed that a lot of my doors are currently open. We'll get back to that here in a second. Next, I checked that my wheels have proper pressure and that they are not overheating. Flight controls currently shows a bunch of locks here because we're not ready for the flight control check phase yet. And that's it. After I'm done doing all that, I personally go back to the door page and I leave it there for now. Lastly, while I'm down here, I check that my METAR data is loaded at my current airport and that it is up to date by, by clicking the update button here. Yeah, we got scattered overcast above us which is that's very clear all the airports lights are currently turned on and lastly I'll come back up here and I'm gonna turn this knob right here to plan mode because I want to check my plan 
And to do that, we go to the flight plan mode here on our uh, MCDU. And I'm just going to cycle through. And you'll see it update over there as we go. Go back one. That right there is our top of climb mark. That's where we should hit our 34,000 feet altitude. There's our top of descent point. We should begin our descent once we hit that point. There's the beginning of our approach onto runway 34 left. And there's the approach to 34 left, and there's the landing. All right, fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and reset myself back to the top of my flight plan. and switch the aircraft back into arc mode. From this point on, it's really just a matter of waiting to make sure everybody is on board. <coughs> so I'm gonna go to the outside of the aircraft real quick. And we're gonna start telling all these guys to walk away. Where's that at? Where's that at? Ground handling. I'm going to bring up the control panel here. We're going to do this in an organized fashion. So first off, catering trucks are going to go away. Notice on the jar design, because jar design are the one who developed ground handling here, this plug-in, notice how it made the doors close automatically. That's a pretty cool feature. There, getting out of here. Next up, we'll get rid of the loaders here. The van can go away. And the air stairs can go away as well. Ah, I ran into myself. Notice that our doors are closing here. The chocks are going to be pulled away from the aircraft. Cones will be removed from the aircraft. And we're done. Hide all equipment. All right. Back inside the aircraft. We check our cargo doors here. We got one cargo door open, so I'm going to go ahead and manually close that. All right, all doors are closed and accounted for. I'm going to switch back to the engine page because I'm going to want to monitor that as we do our pushback here. So we're actually ready to go. We're going to call up the uh, better pushback plug-in right now. And we're going to get our uh, our push plan sorted. Now we're expecting runway one for departure today. So I believe that is a... I am completely disorientated here. Well, it's going to be that away. So we'll go ahead and tell the push tug to push us here. End our push right there. Acknowledge the plan. Ground to cockpit. Plan acknowledged. Call me through the menu when you are ready. All right. We're ready, so let's call uh, ground and let them know we're ready to push back. 
Frontier Flight 719er ready for pushback and engine start. Frontier Flight 719er pushback and engine start approved. Pushback and engine start approved. Frontier Flight 719er. We'll call up the tug here. Ground to cockpit. Tow is driving up. He's gonna ram his way through all these vehicles <laughs> that are in his way. Go away, you. I hate it when X-Plane spawns in crap that I don't need. Okay, all doors and hatches are closed. Ready to connect. Set parking brake. Parking brake is set. You are clear to attach. All right, once he verifies that he is fully connected, we're gonna disengage the anti-skid nose wheel steering system and we'll be ready for the push. So connected and bypassed and inserted. Release parking brake. Clear the mask for caution and let them know you're ready. Parking brake. Uh, Park brake off. off. You're clear to push. Starting pushback and you may start engines. Okay, he's given us permission to start our engines. Now, in the jar design, I'm not completely sure. I, I guess it varies by airline, but I tend to not start the engines until the pushback is complete on the Airbus. And I do that because the built-in checklists, which we need right there, if I click that, the second item on the checklist, my first officer is going to complain about. He's going to say that the gear pins and covers are not removed. So I always wait until the tow pushes us back and disconnects us. That is a pretty bird. A lot of airlines with the Airbus, they won't start the engine until the pushback is complete. This saves on gasoline, and it saves on wear and tear on the engines. There's no point in starting them if you're not going to be able to go anywhere. Operation complete. Set parking brake. Park parking brake is set. Disconnecting tow. Stand by. It is so gray and ugly here today. It's starting to try to break apart up there.
All right, he's cleared the aircraft, so I'm going to turn nose wheel steering back on, and I'm going to clear the error message. Always disconnected, on bypass then has been removed. Hand signal on the left. We'll see you next time and have a safe flight. All right, thank you, sir. See you next time around. And there's the hand signal, and he's got all the flags in his hands. All right, we're clear to finish getting this aircraft ready. All right, so before start checklist to the line, please. Oh, we do need to turn our beacon on first before we do that. That lets everybody know we're about to start the engines. And now we'll do the before start checklist to the line. Before start checklist, cockpit preparation completed. Gear pins and covers removed. Signs on. Adiers. Nav mode. Fuel quantity in kilo. One, two, four, four, zero. Takeoff data set. Barrow reference set. Windows. Doors closed. Beacon on. Throttle levers idle. Parking brake on. Checklist completed. All right. We're ready to start the engines here. Start sequence will be two, then one. And first up. We turn off the packs because we're going to need the air to start the engines. Engine mode selector to ignition starter. And start engine number two, please. Starting engine two. And we will monitor the engine right here. There she goes. She's firing up. In two speed, good. Engine gas temperature rising. In one, spooling up. Pressure rising in number two. Listening for the generator two kick on. There goes generator two. Clear to start engine one. Starting engine one. Monitor. In two, spooling up. EGT rising, in one spin up, pressure rising, listening for generator one, and generator one is online. Now before we do the after start uh, part of the takeoff uh, our checklist here. Uh, we need to clear all the blue items here on the upper ECAM. So to do that here, we need auto brake set to max. We need our spoilers to be armed. Spoilers arm. We need our flaps to be set in the takeoff position that we agreed to during programming, which is flaps two. Flaps one. Flaps two. And we have no blue status on the ECAMs. They are moving into position, and they are locked in place. All right, after start checklist, please. After start checklist, anti-ice, as required. Ecam status, checked. Pitch trim, zero decimal, five down. Rudder trim, zero. APU, set on. Ground crew, clear. Anti-skid and nose wheel steering, on. Checklist completed. All right, flight controls check, please. Flight control check, full up. All right, so we're gonna monitor our flight controls here. You'll see this little cross move, and also you'll see it move here on the lower Ecam. Check, full down. Check, neutral, check, full left, check, full right, check, neutral, check. Press pedals disconnect push button, check, pedal full left, check, pedal full right, check, neutral, check. Press pedals disconnect push button, check, checklist completed. All right, and we're actually ready to start our taxi. Frontier Flight 719er, ready to taxi, runway 1. 
Frontier Flight 719er taxi to runway 01 via taxiways Bravo, Alpha, Charlie, hold short runway 04, and runway 01. Taxi to runway 01 via taxiways Bravo, Alpha, Charlie, hold short runway 04, and runway 01, Frontier Flight 719er. All right, taxi lights on. And packs re-engaged, get the AC running back there again. Parking brake off. Park brake off. Engine start switch, or engine mode back to normal. And we're ready. Here we go. Runway one is just around the corner over there. Oh, and don't forget to turn your TCAS uh, system on. This upper knob here needs to be switched to active. There we go. Ground friction at Drudeski's airport here is pretty high. Unfortunately, pilot to ATZ's database on this air, particular airport is not set right. So at this point, we would wait for crossing clearance, and of course, he, he'd give it to us. So we're going to go ahead and proceed on through. Because the whole point for this runway is way, way across the runway. Double check that the flight path is clear on both ends, that it's safe to cross, and across we go. I'm actually working with uh, Dave from Pilot ATC to get these airports more accurate. All the hold points and everything. Frontier Flight 719er contact tower on 119.1. Good day. Tower on 119.1, Frontier Flight 719. -er. Park brake on. And let's ask them and let them know. Frontier Flight 719er holding short runway 01, ready for departure. Frontier Flight 719er winds are 030 at 10 knots cleared for takeoff. Lights runway on full. 01. Turn off lights on. Strobe on. Clear for takeoff runway 01. Frontier Flight 719er. We switch the weather radar to the on position, adjust the tilt to look straight ahead of the aircraft here. Oh, be sure we uh, actually have the doors to our cabin locked. 
Should have did that earlier during the before start checklist. All right, and parking brake off. Park brake off. before takeoff checklist here, but uh, before takeoff checklist to the line. Before takeoff checklist. Flight controls. Checked. Flight instruments. Checked. Briefing. Confirmed. Flap settings config. Flaps 2. V1. 1. 4. 5. V rotate. 1. 5. 0. V2. 1. 6. 1. Flex temperature. 4. 0. ATC. Set. ECAM memo. No blue. Checklist down to the line completed. If you're ready to continue below the line, Click it again. The down to the line should be done before you enter the runway, and then once you're on the runway lined up, you can you do the uh, below the line. Cabin crew advised. Engine mode selector set normal as where required. Packs set on. Course of APU bleed. Checklist below the line completed. All right, next up is the actual takeoff roll here. Now, there's a big difference uh, between the way a Boeing throttle quadrant works and the way the Airbus works, because this is controlled by the FDAC, which is a digital flight control computer for managing the engine thrust. Up to a certain point, you have full control over the amount of throttle you have. I think it's about 55%. But once you hit this dent, this is the climb dent, and then you have the flex temperature dent, and then you have maximum takeoff go around power. Now, because we are using flex temperature today, we're only going to go to the second dent during our takeoff roll, which is flex temperature mode. And that will get us the proper thrust that we need to uh, save on wear and tear and all that other good stuff. So, first up, we're going to roll up the engines here, stabilize them, and then we'll uh, advance the throttle to the flex temperature mode. All right, engines are stable. Forward to flex temperature. Flex temperature Power arm. set. Auto throttle On arm. Way. One. Apply a little forward pressure here so the nose doesn't pop up. Speed is alive. This is a bumpy runway. Holy crap. 60 knots. 80 knots. Use 100 knots. I need more power, full power, maximum power. This is gonna, we're going to be cutting this one close. Holy crap! One thousand feet remaining. Five hundred. Holy shit! Rotate. Woo! <laughs> Positive climb. Gear up. Gear up. Mode. Oh, oh. <laughs> Boy, we barely made it. All right, flaps to level one. Speed check. Flaps one. Check. 
flaps That's up. zero. We're actually going to switch. Don't sink. Don't sink. Don't sink. Autopilot Don't on. Sink. Don't sink. Don't sink. Don't sink. Come on, autopilot. Speed up. Autopilot, autopilot one. one cross check. We actually have a speed restriction here, so I had to take control of the speed from the computer there. Frontier Flight 719er climb and maintain 12,000 feet. Climb and maintain 12,000 feet, Frontier Flight 719er. Frontier Flight 719er contact Potomac departure on 125.65. Have a good morning. Oops, skip this. Departure on 1215.65, Frontier Flight 719er. Frontier Flight 719er out of 4,000 feet for 1, 2,000 feet. Frontier Flight 719er, good morning. Radar contact. All right, we need to clean up the aircraft here after our departure. Spoilers disarm. Spoilers disarm. Check that the flaps are in the up position. And we can do our after takeoff checklist here. After takeoff checklist. Landing gear up. Flaps retracted. Packs on. Checklist down to the line completed. If you're ready to continue below the line, click it again. Now in the jar design, you don't want to click it again until you're actually past the transition altitude, which for us is 18,000 feet. I'm not going to stick around here for 18,000 feet though. This pretty much concludes today's tutorial on how to get this aircraft from cold and dark to uh, taking off. Our speed restriction is gone though, so I'm going to return control of the speed of the aircraft here by clicking that little hot spot just above the button. We are now accelerating. All right, the aircraft is in full control of all speed and all lateral navigation. Once we cross the 10,000 foot marker, we're going to switch off all of our lights. And we can also do one final cleanup of the aircraft here. We no longer need the APU bleed and we no longer need the APU, so we can deactivate those. Frontier Flight 719er climb and maintain flight level 200 contact Washington Center on 135.07. Have a nice day. And 10,000 feet. We'll acknowledge them in a second. Lights off. Center on 135.07. Take care, Frontier Flight 719er. Frontier Flight 719er with you out of 10,000 feet for flight level 200. Frontier Flight 719er, good morning. Radar contact. And that is the conclusion of today's tutorial. Hopefully you found this useful. Um, this went much smoother than, uh, than my last attempt here, so... Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And I hope this gets you uh, up in the air with the Jar Design A320. So, our next video is going to be some more fully loaded flights. And we're actually going to start doing A320 fully loaded flights over in Europe. I finally have all my Ortho for XP scenery loaded in. I bought like 30 or 40 airports off the Org store during the big Memorial Day sale. Those are all installed and tested to be sure that they're working, and they are. 
so I am ready to start flying in Europe. Uh, but before that, I have to do a requested flight for a flight in South America aboard a 737-800 with Caribbean Airlines. We'll be doing that next. And then after that, it's a free world for me. So, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate uh, all you guys tuning in with me. I appreciate your comments. And uh, we'll see you next time around. Until then, Captain K-Man is up and out.